Hey guys, welcome to that Florida feeling. How is everybody this week? It's still hot. It's kind of rainy, but it's really still hot. Hope everybody's had a good week. Thanks to everybody who messed with the social media pages. I really appreciate it. And for those of you who have checked out the YouTube, I'm trying. I think I've got the shorts down, the videos. I don't know. I'm trying. It, I guess it's a art form or a work in progress or something. But uh, as always, the Facebook group. I love everybody who posts the memes uh, and answers the polls and questions. It's really strange because a lot more people liked um, Cinnamon Raisin on Facebook and a lot more people liked everything on Instagram. I guess it is really just two different kinds of people that use those platforms. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter or X. It will always be Twitter. I'm not going to lie. I want my bird back. Um, <laughs> it's still Twitter. And of course, TikTok. You can see all the kind of fun things I'm doing in Florida. Check out some places. Been doing a lot of restaurant reviews lately. I got a lot of requests for that. So I'm trying to keep it relevant. But again, you guys are awesome. I can't thank you enough. Um, just, yeah, you guys make this successful every week, and just thank you. So today I want to talk about somewhere fun. Um, I want to talk about South Beach, or Sobe. I don't, I don't actually know that I've ever heard anybody call it Sobe, but apparently its nickname is Sobe. But I'm talking about South Beach, the famous neighborhood in Miami known for its late nights, beautiful oceans, stiff drinks, amazing food, some amazingly fit people that you kind of get jealous of when they walk by. And, of course, white sandy beaches. South Beach is actually located in Miami, or east of Miami, between Biscayne Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. The area also doesn't actually inc include Miami Beach, and that is south of Dade Boulevard. The area is really the life of Miami most nights. Like, South Beach is the place to be a lot of times, and it's definitely worth going to at least once because you want to see the sights. You want to see the famous Art Deco hotels. You want to see the beach. You want to see the people. You want to see the restaurants. You want to eat some amazing food. And, I mean, when you're down there, you really can't pass up eating a true Miami-style Cuban. At least I couldn't. It was delicious. But I'll talk to you about that in a minute. South Beach wasn't always fun, though. Um, in fact, South Beach wasn't even really truly known for the beach. It was actually known for its farmland. That's right. It was a farm. The area was originally purchased in 1870 by Henry and Charles Lum. Okay, I have a question, though, first. Who did they buy it from? Like, who owned it? Like, was the state of Florida who just got founded, like, just selling land off? Or, like, did people just walk around and put their stake down? Like, this is mine now, and I pay the bank $3? Like, how did that work? I'm sorry. I, that just confuses me. Like... Who did Henry and Charles Lum purchase it from? I always want to know that when it's like, these are the first owners. Okay, but who? Who was first? I mean, Native Americans, but who was first? You know what I mean? Sorry, minor rant. So they purchased the 165 acres that were going to be used for coconut farming. I will admit in the podcast um, that I have been uh, researching, that's the first time I've ever heard anybody buying any land in Florida for coconut farming. I've heard citrus, sugarcane, tobacco, even cotton. But this is a first for coconut farming. Charles Lum actually built the first house on the land. Actually, it was right on the beach in 1886. So they didn't really waste a lot of time in getting their farm up and then moving right in. Um, only about 16 years, which seems like a long time, but in those days, it was actually kind of quick. Now, the brothers did actually stay on the island for a few years. Uh, they ended up, ultimately, though, leaving the island in 1894, and they left the plantation in control of John... They left it to John Collins. He was going to be the man to run their coconut farm or plantation. And Collins came to the area two years later to survey the land to see what else it could be used for in the future. You know, he wanted to know what he was actually over. So he ended up using the land for farming because he actually found a fresh water source and then he continued to purchase more land in the area. And he did so in 1907. Now, the area is starting to begin to attract more people. Um, the early 1900s, people became kind of tourists and the land boom kind of started happening. So in 1912, the Loomis brothers, who were Miami business... Bent, let me try that word again. Businessmen bought 400 acres from Collins... Because they wanted to build an oceanfront city that would have a modest single-family residences. And I can just imagine back then those fa single-family residences may have sold for, I don't know, $1,000, which was probably a fortune back then. 
And now those same single family residences would be a million point two or something, maybe even two to three million. It's just amazing how the area grew up and inflation. Sorry, back to it. Collins was still living in the area at the time, though. And Collins built wanted to build a bridge from Miami to Miami Beach. And so he started the project, and he even had people give him money to help continue the project. However, he had to stop because he ran out of money. So there's a there was just a half-completed bridge for a while. Now, Carl G. Fisher was another man who helped make this area popular. He was actually a successful businessman who made his millions after selling a business to Union Carbide in 1909. And then he decided he wanted to go to warmer places in 19, 1913, so he came to Miami. And then he wanted to establish South Beach as a successful city that was actually independent of Miami. He wanted to make the area great. He wanted it to be something all of on, it, on its own. He even gave the $50,000 to complete the bridge that John Collins had started years earlier. And actually he completed it finally in 1913. And I say years earlier. It was like two, two years earlier. So Collins Fisher and the Loomis brothers began to work together in March of 1915. They realized that if they worked together, they could make South Beach into something amazing. And so... They first started by incorporating the town of Miami Beach. That was their first step, was to incorporate a town. And this led to some good things. In 1920, the County Causeway, which is now the MacArthur Causeway, uh, happened. The Loomis Brothers also began to sell oceanfront properties from 6th to 14th Streets in the city. And this area is actually still known as Loomis Park today. So if you've heard of Loomis Park, this is the area I'm talking about. 1920 brought the official Miami land boom to this part of Florida, and South Beach's main streets, which are 5th, Alton Road, Collins Avenue, Washington Avenue, and Ocean Drive, were all deemed suitable for automobile traffic. So that meant these were prime areas. People were starting to drive automobiles over roads to come down to South Florida. The, the railroad was happening. And so this started to attract a lot of people, and it attracted a lot of millionaires. Harvey Firestone, J.C. Penney, Harry C. Stoltz, Albert Champion, and Rockwell LaGorge all built homes on Miami Beach. And, of course, you have plenty of other people in the area that were just as rich and just as famous. I mean, Henry Flagler had his in Palm Beach, just a few, uh, maybe an hour or so north. And many other of the, uh, we're going to call them tycoons, because they weren't all oil tycoons. But the tycoons had already come to Florida, had made their mark all the way down the coast, and Miami was really the last place to uh to build this was the last frontier almost for the millionaires to build their new homes and of course the area attracted everybody even including the president at the time president harding who stayed in the flamingo hotel and when he did that only increased you know interest in the area people now more people are like oh the president's gonna stay there oh i gotta go see what this is about or what's going on there or it looks really nice because you know if the president stays somewhere there's a million pictures and people saw the pictures and then they're like oh i kind of think i want to go there so the area was, uh, was definitely growing, although the problem was, at that time, the area wasn't necessarily welcoming to everybody. The area was actually well known for being anti-Semitic. Um, they did not welcome the Jews. The area actually used anti-Semitic covenants, or generally known agreements, to keep Jews out of the area. They didn't want them living or staying north of, south of 5th Street. They didn't, they didn't want him even staying in the hotels. And the policies were so well written and very explicit that they targeted Jewish property owners, tourists, and t possible tenants through racial covenants in property deeds and hotels. Now, pardon my French, but that's just some asshole people. You know, that, that was a horrible thinking at that time. I mean, thankfully it's not like that anymore. But... The fact that, that that was even a thing back then is stupid. Like, I can't, I just, I don't know. I mean, I'm glad that people's ways of thinking are changed. Because I can't believe that they just wanted to keep Jews out of their entire area. That's, that's horrible. But it didn't, you know, it didn't last long. South Beach actually started to change, uh, especially in the 1930s. And the 1930s really brought the change in architecture that began to take over that area. And that's actually some of the architecture that we still see today. The Art Deco, the Streamline Modern, and the uh, Modical Modern architectures were all taking over the area. 
And South Beach was actually, like, the center of that Art Deco and the Streamline. In fact, South Beach actually claims to have the world's largest collection of Streamline modern Art Deco architecture anywhere in the world. The next closest is a place in New Zealand. So the area was changing, and it was growing, and it even was doing this through the Depression. So I'm not sure the area really felt the Depression like some other parts of Florida. And the area continued to grow. It was home to over 28,000 people by 1940. But the area then quickly changed again in 1941. 1941 brought on the attack of Pearl Harbor, which meant that the United States was now going to enter World War II. And that impacted Florida. It impacted Florida so much so that the Army Air Corps actually took over Miami Beach. I actually was just talking to a friend about this. They were telling me that training took place on the beach. They also mentioned that there's a high school nearby that actually has a statue commemorating the class of that year because most of them were actually taken out of school and immediately shipped out to the war. I'll be honest with you. When I do research on some of these topics for the podcast or even just talk to people who've lived here a long time, locals, you know, people who've lived here 20, 30 years, I find out some of the coolest stuff. I would never have thought that there was even a statue commemorating that, let alone that the Army took over Miami. I mean, I knew they took over Key West, but I didn't know they took over Miami. To me, that's just insane. But of course, as the war ended and things began to change, um, tourism continued to grow. It continued to pick up. It was still a popular area. And in 1964, it became even more popular. Jackie Gleason brought his weekly variety series to the area for tapings. And that was super rare at that time. I mean, it's still rare today, but that was very rare at the time for him, for a celebrity like that, to bring his variety show to a different location and let, you know, people from that part of the country go and actually witness and see. And so it's really kind of cool. And that really actually helped Miami grow a lot more than people realize. I mean, the area was already bringing in over 2 million tourists a year at that time. And that just really helped to increase those numbers and to just drive them even higher. And, of course, South Beach was still a popular spot, and it really was a popular spot from the 1960s through the mid-1980s. But then it began to change. Um, Somewhere near the 1980s, it began to change, and it was actually more of a retirement community. It wasn't the South Beach we know of today. There wasn't nightlife, and there wasn't restaurants. It was a really interesting mix, but it was more you know, older people, the oceanfront hotels and the apartment buildings were filled with older people living on smaller fixed incomes. You're talking about 1980s. This was also the time, you know, when the cocaine cowboys were taking over the area and the godmother of cocaine was reigning her terror over Miami. If you don't know who I'm talking about, I have an entire podcast episode on her. She was a very badass woman. She was a very psychotic woman. Um, But go check it out. It's called the godmother of uh, cocaine. But this is that time where she was reigning terror over Miami and cocaine was sweeping the streets and drugs were everywhere and crime was high. And this area even got popularized in Hollywood uh, in Scarface. You know, Scarface came out in 1983 and it showed that kind of activity and it was popular in Miami. Um, It actually talked about a Cubalito who came during, you know, right around the boat lifts um, before, maybe right before the boat lifts. And made something of themselves in Miami. I mean, granted, it was, you know, drug empire, but it was still something in Miami, and that kind of popularized Miami yet again. And then, of course, Miami Vice. The most popular was Miami Vice, and it actually used South Beach as a backdrop to film for the TV show. You know, but that kind of meant that the area was known for its drug use and criminal activity. In fact, the area was one of the highest crime rates at the time. So... South Beach went from this great tourist area to this Art Deco hotels to, you know, a crime-ridden, really interesting area that people either wanted to be there or avoided like the plague. You know, in the 1980s, people saw the change. They wanted to make this place better. They wanted to start saving the Art Deco hotels that were beginning to be very run down. They wanted to save the one square mile of South Beach and get it on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, The Miami Beach Architectural District was actually officially designated in 1979, and they spent 1980s saving it. And they actually did save many of those buildings. And a lot of those buildings are the ones that you see today. 
Unfortunately, a few, kind of like the New Yorker Hotel, were lost before developers could save it, or lost to developers before it could be saved. But there's still some amazing hotels, like the Betsy Hotel. That is a really cool hotel down near that, down in that district, especially the Betsy Orb. Um, I posted it on the uh, Instagram, the podcast Instagram, and it was really cool. Um, and you get to see all those old Art Deco looking buildings, and just you could tell that back then it was very opulent and beautiful and very nice. But like I said, at this time, 1980s, South Beach was an odd mixture. It was criminals, it was Cubans, it was little white grandmas. You know, that was that was South Beach. It wasn't anywhere what it is today, filled with tourists and a lot of cops. <laughs> and just, you know, it's, it's nice now. Um, but of course, when they started to save the area and they gave it a facelift, it began to attract the wealthier and it began to bring tourists back. And the area, well, what you say, could have a, had a renaissance as they began to save it. And actually, a very interesting thing kind of saved South Beach. The fashion industry kind of saved South Beach. The Versace Mansion is down there. And, you know, the fashion industry took note. And they came to South Beach. Uh, Irene Marie bought the entire Sunray Apartments. Um, by the way, the Sunray Apartments are the... You can see them in the chainsaw scene in Scarface. If you've seen Scarface, remember the chainsaw scene? That's the Sunray Apartments. But Irene Marie bought them and opened Irene Marie Models. And the area began to change and to take notice and to do new things. Now, they say that Thomas Kramer is really to have said to have started the gentrification of the area, the construction boom, the ability to save South Beach. Thomas Kramer is the person that's credited with that. And, of course, South Beach went from, like I said, coconut farming to kind of wealthy to wealthy to crime to fashion to now the playground for the wealthy, the dream of the tourist. But, unfortunately, also, there are a lot of people who say that, yes, it was saved, but it's now a concrete jungle with more high-rise buildings. And, I mean, while they do agree that change has made it more tourist-friendly and way more low-crime, it still kind of, it, it kind of does take away from it. And I mean, there's parts like Ocean Drive, you can still see the, I mean, the hotels are tall, but they're not high rise buildings. And I'm going to tell you when I was down there, you still saw some shady people, you know, saw a lot of homeless. So, I mean, that's, and you're never going to fully get rid of that, but South Beach is a lot better than it was. And, and it's fun today. South Beach is absolutely fun, both day and nighttime. It's full of hotels, boutiques, nightclubs, restaurants. And it really has something for everyone. Plenty of shops, plenty of surf styles. Um, <laughs> and the area is actually very popular from, for tourists from can Canada, Europe, Israel, and most of the Western Hemisphere. In fact, it's a really unique place now. Much more than the criminals, Cubans, and white little old white grandmas. Now... It's more unique because Spanish is actually the first language of most of the people who live down there. English, Portuguese, French, German, and Hebrew are the other languages that you mainly hear in the area. And the other thing about South Beach is, is that, yeah, Hurricane Andrew, I mean, it, it hurt it. It hurt it a lot. But when it rebuilt, it gave itself a facelift. I mean, you have beautiful, colorful buildings now and colorful lifeguard towers that you can see all along the beach. And, you know, they saved the, the hotels that are still there. And everything just kind of got a facelift. And it kind of made South Beach even a little bit better. And the one thing that I think is really cool about South Beach is that it's home to a vibrant LGBT community. Um, the 80s and 90s really cemented that for South Beach as it was the nightlife for the gay life. And that's a quote that I saw. And their area is home to many hotels, clubs, nightlife that are absolutely proud to be a part of this community. I saw a ton of it. It was great. Ocean Drive is a hot spot for socializing. And then there's a whole area in Lincoln Road, which I'll talk about Lincoln Road in a second. And it's very, very LGBTQ friendly. Um, it's a great place for shopping and going for drinks and socializing where you feel safe. And South Beach is also home to the, a large Pride Parade and Pride Festival that goes from 5th Street to 15th Street. Now, this parade and festival was started in 2009, so, you know, it's been going for 10 years, and it's still growing. 
and it's still going, and that's really cool. One thing that calls this area South Beach home is the World Erotic Art Museum. That is right. The museum calls the Art Deco District home. The museum is actually more than a museum. It's a museum, it's a library, and it's an education think tank that uses its collection to show the history of erotic art. So it really does try to educate people, and it's a really cool collection. The collection includes sculptures, drawings, paintings, and photographs that are from anything from folk art to historic to world, paint, world famous artists that include Picasso, Dolly, Rembrandt, and Bunny Yeager. It's really cool. Um, you see a lot of interesting sculptures, you'll see a lot of interesting photographs, and it really takes, you know, it is erotic, so you know what that means, but it really gives you another look at it, and it is something that erotic, erotic art has been around for a very, very long time, and so it, it, it's really cool to see that they have saved it, and they have an entire library of it, and that, you know, this is something that, it is relevant, it is absolutely relevant to history, so you can go there, and you can purchase tickets, it's about $30, they're, they're open weird hours, so if you want to go, you should definitely check out their online website, um, I don't know why I said that, because if you're online, it's obviously a website, but you should definitely go and check it out to make sure that the times you're going are open, they do have some interesting hours, but it's, it's really cool, I, if you're a historian of any kind, or an art lover of any kind, I definitely recommend this place. Of course, Ocean Drive is the most popular part of South Beach. It is along the ocean. Um, one side is the Atlantic Ocean, which is the white, sandy, beautiful beaches, the cool lifeguard towers. Um, you know, and it's got a really cool walkway in front of it, um, like a trail. There's public bathrooms, lots of beautiful palm trees, shade. I saw people doing yoga, working out, hanging out with friends, walking their dogs, exercising, which I probably should have been doing. But... It's a really, really cool area. Um, and of course, it is popular with tourists. It's also home to the Versace Mansion. And I will talk about the Versace Mansion in another podcast. And of course, parallel to Ocean Drive is Collins Avenue. And that's also home to many Art Deco hotels. That's where a lot of your nightclubs, restaurants, and boutiques are. There's a lot of fashion houses. Um, Collins Drive is way, way more packed as far as people and, you know, because part of Ocean Drive is not open to cars. Part of the Art Deco District is, they have closed it as a historic mile, and they do not let cars on part of it. And that's really cool, because it allows tourists to just kind of walk around and to do their own thing. But um, Collins Avenue is crazy. I mean, it is, it is packed with people. It is packed with tourists. We saw people pulling luggage everywhere. We saw an armed guard standing there as a truck was unloaded for a sh for a fashion shop. I mean, you know, we kind of saw a little bit of everything. There's a lot of smoke shops. There's a lot of mom and pop shops. There's a lot of restaurants. It's really strange. You know, it's a really interesting mix on Collins Avenue. Um, so if you're going to go to Ocean Drive, walk the block over, look at the Betsy Orb, and then go down Collins Avenue. Because the Betsy Orb is in a um, alleyway, basically, between Collins Avenue and Ocean Drive. But it's, it's a really interesting area. And then you have Lincoln Road, which is an open-air pedestrian mall that is considered the shopping area of South Beach. The area was actually originally a mangrove forest that Carl Fisher cleared out part of and made it the, the newly town, the town of Miami Beach, their town center. The area has gone through gentrific gentrification as well um, to go from rundown to modern. The area was saved as well as the rest of it in the 1980s, and they saved it more as an arts and cultural center. The area has since been revived. It's full of shops, restaurants. It even has a well-known cinema. The area is also home to the New World Center Concert Hall, and you can see some amazing architecture. The architecture shows off Old Florida and Miami and Lincoln Road. You can see Art Deco. You can see some amazing fountains and sculptures. And thanks to the redesign in the 1950s, you can see how that would have looked back in that time. I don't think that there was a croc store in the 1950s or a turvis store, but you know what I mean. I don't actually know if those are down there, but those are the two I thought of. Because every time you go to, like, some place that has all the, you see all those, you always see crocs. I don't know why. I have no idea. But they're there everywhere. South Beach is a mixture of old Florida and new Florida. I think that everyone should go at least once. I think it's a fun part of Florida. It's very definitely part of a historical part of Florida. 
I actually just went last week. Um, I took the Brightline train. And while it's very beautiful and the beach is amazing, it's also very touristy. Um, very touristy. You know, you, you see a, a 1950s beautiful Art Deco hotel and in the basement is a surf style. It, you know, it's very strange. There's some really cool restaurants. We did go to... Um, we, we stopped at a small little walk-in kitchen and got the best Miami Cuban that I've ever had in my entire life. You know, like I'm craving one right now as I'm talking about it again. Um, we, we did stop for some drinks at a couple places. I do not recommend Wet Willies. That is just... That's just nasty. Um, it, it's like a daiquiri bar, and, and there are plenty of other places to go. I'm, I'm sad that I bought a drink there. But... There were plenty of other cool places. Uh, a lot of places, if you want to buy a souvenir, you can go in. A lot of places that have outdoor open seating. Because, you know, that's probably great in, like, uh, September. It was not great in the end of July, beginning of August. But anyways, uh, definitely a place you want to go at least once. You want to check it out. The Art district, art Deco District is really cool. Um, they have a really cool clock thermometer thing that sits near one of the public bathrooms. They even have a uh, welcoming center. I'll post a picture of it. So, you know, it's they really did a good job in saving South Beach. They really did a good job in preserving that history that started with a coconut farm and has ended to the nightlife that we know of it today. Now, of course, like I said, when you're down there, there's going to be tourists. There's going to be residents trying to live there. There's going to be cops trying to make sure that nobody gets in fights or nothing happens. But everybody is just trying to avoid Florida, man. And... Miami is just a hot spot for Florida man, y'all. And our, our Florida man today comes out of Miami. And the headline reads, Florida man busted after masturbating inside of Starbucks. Yep, you heard me right. Fun fact, I used to uh, work for Starbucks. And I can tell you that that happens a lot more than you realize. Uh, the, homeless, the homeless man, who was a self-proclaimed male model, was arrested for masturbating in front of people on a Starbucks off Collins Avenue. Yes, even in South Beach. Homeless male models exist, and apparently they jack off in Starbucks. No part of Florida is safe from Florida, man. I'm telling you, you guys. But thank you for listening. I appreciate you guys so much. Check out all the social media sites. Check out my YouTube attempts. Um, check out the TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. You know, I'm, I aim for Wednesday on the poll. Sometimes it's Thursday. I apologize. Thanks for sticking with me, you guys. Life happens. Don't forget it is still hurricane season, so you've still got to be prepared. Uh, they just re-released the another uh, forecast, and it's not pretty. I mean, of course, we've had years go by where nothing happens, and I always pray every year that we go by and nothing happens. Um, but still, you got to stay prepared. You never know what can happen. Um, bottled water doesn't go bad. Canned ravioli. Chef Boyardee doesn't. I mean, it takes a while to go bad. You can eat it cold, um, beans, corn, you know, candles, have candles, have lighters, have batteries, have a flashlight, you know, if you have pets, have whatever you need, pet food, medications, you know, just be prepared, guys. It literally could come at any time, I mean, we, we do get a warning, but we're in that season, so just be prepared, guys. Everybody needs to stay hydrated. It's hot out there, you guys. Stay hydrated, be nice to one another, and as always, that's your daily dose of sunshine.